I don't know what you mean. <laughs> so you're, you're telling me that, that you don't struggle with sin and that you have nothing to confess? No. No. So I, I did sense just a little hesitancy. I, are you telling me maybe there's something to confess in the deep, dark recesses of your heart? No. No, not at all. Huh. Well, okay. Okay. But, but you cannot tell anyone. No, it's safe. This no is the, one. This is the safe zone. Well, instead of parking at the Baylor parking lot like I was asked to do, oh. I in fact parked down here in this front parking lot and as, as close to the front door as I possibly could. Oh. You, you are sick. You disgust me. Turn that off. Stop, stop. Good evening. We'll be looking in Hebrews chapter 12 tonight. That guy that didn't have a problem with any sin makes me want to watch Breaking Bad all over again. <laughs> Anybody there ever watch that? ridiculous we all have something we all have issues that we need to work on There's some issues that we have to work on need to have been dealt with probably some time ago and we should be past some of those things by now I think that at times people expect God to just change them automatically into perfection. God views us through his son's sacrifice on the cross as perfect. And we should have the desire to be better or more mature. The Bible has a word for it. That word is perfect. God views us as complete, not because of who we are or what we've done, but because we've placed our faith and trust in His Son, Jesus Christ, and that alone. That alone gives us good standing and right standing before God. His Son was the only one who was perfect. We're not perfect, but we should, really, we really should try to live better today tomorrow than we did today, or better today than we did yesterday. We ought to be actively growing in our life. And what I found with, with people, uh, and I was this way too for a long time, is I wouldn't deal with certain things in my life until they were forced upon me to do. And then when I finally had to deal with those issues in my life, and got victory and went on and moved on, I wondered why I did not do this years ago. You know, why didn't, I, why didn't I just, you know, confront this issue in my life years ago and move on? It, I'd been a lot better off. And so <clears throat> I want us to be encouraged tonight. I don't want to bring a message that's going to be, you know, uh, I like how Morris put it, uh, we're not here to beat up, we're here to build up. You know, we need to be built up. We need to be encouraged as God's people. We need to encourage one another. The New Testament, time after time, tells us to, to encourage one another, and that's what we ought to do. One of the ways that we can encourage one another is encourage one another with love, and that's saying things in love, and that's what I want to do tonight, is take the Scripture in love and present it in a way that might encourage you. I hope it does. But also motivate a person to change, to be different, tomorrow than you were today or different even this afternoon or this, this evening than you were this morning. I think that God always expects of us and desires from us change in our life, growth. It's called growth. You know, you don't want to be a 40-year-old baby, you know. 
somebody carrying, and, and the, yet the church in Corinth uh, that Paul had to deal with, that's basically what he called them. They were, they were grown adults, but they were acting like babies. They were, they were still doing things that their old sin nature they did when, before they were saved. They were still interacting in all types of man, in all manner of sin, and they knew better, and they weren't doing any better. And Paul had to say, you know, I'd like to move on and teach you greater things in the Word of God. I'm paraphrasing. But you're babies. You can't, you can't take it. You've got to drink milk. You know, you need to be, learn how to eat meat and, and move on. And God wants that for you and I in recovery. He wants us to be able to eat meat and move on, not stay on the milk. Recovery, and the whole process itself, is to getting us from point A on into growth, on into maturity, on into stability, over to the point where we become ministers, not just takers, givers, not just takers. All of Christianity is that way, but, but recovery, it's either do or die for you and, you and me. If you're an addict, it's either do or die. I'm either going to be recovered and walk in newness of life, or I'm going to die doing my drugs and drinking. I'm just going to die doing it. So for me, I have to grow continually every day. I have to strive to do better, strive to grow. And it's not a chore. This is not a chore. This is not something that I'm saying that's just hard to do. It's going to, but there is some struggles. There are some things that you will have to do initially that will feel like a lot of work. But if you're not willing, if we're not willing to put forth some effort, then you're not going to get much out of your recovery life. Morris spoke about sponsorship. That's the last thing anybody really wants uh, most of the time is somebody telling them what they need to be doing. <laughs> you know, like a nanny or something. You know, we don't want that. We, we, most, most people, and especially now in these times we live in, most people are pretty rebellious against any type of authority. But I had a good friend and was my sponsor, and he's just a normal guy like, like anybody else, and he was a drunk. I mean, he had the problem, but he was recovered. So he knew more than I did on the subject of being recovered and the subject of walking in a new life. He knew more than I did. He had a year clean when I met him. I had one day. I had to allow this man access to my life. I had to actually allow him to tell me what I needed to do and not needed to do. So there's a lot of people that don't have a sponsor, and it's, and it's a lot of times it's this. Number one, no desire to do it. You don't want to put anything into your recovery. I'm just being frank here tonight. Or number two, you don't want anybody messing with you. Well, you're going to have to trust somebody. You're going to have to. I mean, are, are you spinning your wheels by being here? I don't want to be that, you know, I just, I've just got to be forward about it. There's a time when we need to sit down and say, and, and take an honest inventory of ourselves and say, am I doing anything any better today than I did yesterday? Or last year? Or am I still in the same circle of horrible events? And if so, then something needs to change. Get a sponsor. Number one, get a sponsor. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We can look to Jesus and see what he went through, and we can be encouraged. He did that for you and I. So we can move forward and not faint and lose heart. There's somebody pulling for you tonight. I want to look at four things out of this portion of Scripture that will help us on our road to recovery. Number one, uh, it says, let us throw off, in verse one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and that means 
those that have gone on before us, or those that are even right here, each other as brothers and sisters, all, all of the people that are there for support, whether they're saints of God in heaven, whether the, the, even the angels or the people right here, this great cloud of witnesses pulling for you tonight. Let us throw off everything that hinders. There's things that hinder us. And it's up to you and I. It doesn't say, let's pray about it a while. Let me ask my pastor if I should. There are some things that you and I can throw off. These are things that, that you and I can throw off without much of a hassle if we want to. If we want to move on with God, if we want recovery, there are some things, and everybody's thing is different. <laughs> I can tell you a few of my things that I had to throw off. They were called my friends. <laughs> I had to throw them off. You know where I see my old friends now? In recovery. <laughs> I run into people that I used to be with. Now I find them in the places where I wish they'd have been years ago when I was getting recovery for the first time. But I had to throw off some of those old friends. And I wasn't rude about it. I invited them into my house, and I said, I'd like for, for you to sit down and let me show you from the Bible what God says and what God has done for me. Because I'm free, and I want you to be free too. Well, they'd leave. I just like me throwing them off. <laughs> they got thrown off, amen? Some people used to say I was thrown off. I still am kind of thrown off. But I threw them off. I had to make a decision. I couldn't hang out with them. Every time I hung out with them, I went to the club, and all I had to do was drink one or two beers, and I was over in Fort Worth on the north side banging dope. It only took a couple of hours because that would set off the bigger craving I had. I was a fiend. And by the end of the night, I'd spent all my money and yours. Two beers, all it took. But it started with me going with people I shouldn't have been with. I didn't need to be with them. I had a good friend. Well, there was, there was a couple of us. There were three of us, actually. And when NA first started in Sulphur Springs, the very first group that I knew of that started... It was started by a friend of mine who was trying to help me recover. He'd, he was an older gentleman. He had a lot of AA in him, and he wanted to really help me, and he wanted to help young people, and he saw an epidemic. You know, we were all on meth, and, and, he, and he really wanted to help. So he said, I'm going to start an NA group. So he started this NA group with me and two of my friends. And after the group, we'd all go to the club together. <laughs> it was horrible. We didn't get recovery. We hung around after the group. We talked each other into drinking a pitcher of beer. And then we would split and go our separate ways to our own little dope fiend ways. And about six months later, we'd all end up back in the NA group again. And we knew we were poison for each other, really. I didn't need to hang out afterwards with them. They only had two days sobriety. I only had two days sobriety. You might have some friends here tonight that only have a few days sobriety. You actually need to be hanging around somebody that's got a year. You need a sponsor. You need somebody that's got something solid in them. You'll drag each other down. You'll go to reminiscing about old dope days and dope deals and drinking and dancing and womanizing and all that mess, and pretty soon, boom, you're back out doing it. I could sit here and talk about it all night, but I'm afraid somebody will get set off and get, get to Jones and... <laughs> I have to split here in a minute and go get a beer or something. <laughs> throw it off. That was just my deal. That was just one of my deals. I had to throw off. And that was hindering me, you see. It was hindering me. People can hinder you. Well, let's run. Let us run. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance. Let us run. You know, the Bible tells us to flee immorality, flee youthful lust, to flee, to run. That's not cowardice. That's not being a coward. Running from temptation is not being weak and cowardice. It's being wise. It's being saying, it's saying, hey, I can't handle this. I need to leave. I got to get out of this party. I got to get away from these people that I've thrown off <laughs> because they're thrown off. <laughs> I got to get away from them. I got to leave. Don't hang around. Don't hang around. The moment you start dragging your feet and start finding a place to sit down, next thing you'll be doing is banging dope. I guarantee it. I came back from a treatment facility in Texarkana. I spent six months over there at that one. That was a short term for me. <laughs> I, I, like, I like rehabs. I could get real spiritual in rehabs. <laughs> Didn't have to do anything in rehab. You're surrounded by everything. Everything's done for you. There's no dope in most of the places. Pretty easy to get sober in a rehab. It's out here. Out here where you have to throw off things and flee from things. So I was in this rehab for six months in Texarkana, came back to Sulphur Springs. First people I looked up, the people I should have thrown off. Found them. Went to the apartment. There they were sitting around drinking home brew. They then made some brew in their closet. I turned that down. I was all right, I turned that down. But I sat down. Instead of running, instead of leaving, I sat down. And next thing you know, dude comes in, got some dope. They score some dope. They look at me, they go, man, you know, we'll go in the back room and do this. I mean, we don't want to mess you up. I mean, you coming from rehab and all. We don't want you, you know, getting messed up. I said, it's okay, man. I, you know, go ahead. Do what you got to do. I ain't worried about it. It ain't going to hurt me any. Next thing I know, I'm doing dope with them. Next thing they know, see, they could do dope. You know those people that can drink on the weekend, get up and not drink all week, maybe not even take a drink for a month? And then not bother them at all. There's some people that can do a little dope and party a little bit, and they just leave it. They're not addicted to it yet. They can just go. These two guys were like that. They didn't care what they did. It was the weekend they partied. They did a little this, a little that. Me? I'll rob you blind. <laughs> I'll get everything you've got. I'll do all your dope, take all your money, go somewhere, buy that dope, then break back in and steal the dope, do all the dope. I couldn't stop. Do a little dope. Drink a little beer. I sit there. Next thing you know, I'm out. And they're like, can't you just chill, man? Can't you just act like us? Can't you just do a little bit and party and stay here and just be, you know, have, let's have some fun. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I had to go to the dope dealer. I had to go buy quantity. I couldn't sit there. I'm not normal. I can't do that. I need to run. And it's not a shame to do it. It will save your life. Let us run. You know, there's a... Before we go any further with that, I'm going to stay right there. There's a sin that so easily entangles us. You know, there's some weight that we need to throw off, everything that hinders us. There's also some sin that in, it's, it just easily entangles. And that's the personal sin. You know what mine was? Dishonesty. For some reason, I just lied all the time. Just grew up lying. I guess it was a safety mechanism for me. Some way to 
keep things from or keep things from happening to me or from me being accountable for anything. I, I always had a lie. It carried over into my Christian life after I was born again, only I felt bad about it. Horrible. I couldn't get away with it. And it was stupid, you know, it's it's almost like an addiction to me. I'd just say something. It would just come out. And I'd think about, man, that wasn't right. You know how God broke me of that? He made me apologize to everyone that I did that to. I'd have to go back and I'd say, you know what I just told you? That's a bald-faced lie. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just lied to you. I don't know why I did. I just, just, just lied to you. Forgive me. And they'd look at me like I was crazy. After three or four times of that, you get to where you start cutting that off. Amen? That was the sin that would entangle me. And you see, I couldn't sleep at night after I lied to somebody. It would bother me. It would worry me to death. And I wanted to use dope. I wanted to drink. Because it would eat my lunch. When I first got into recovery, they said, this is an honest program. You're going to have to be honest, rigorously honest. I was like, man, <laughs> my brother and I were just born natural liars. And we were, you see, because Satan is the father of lies. He's a liar and the father of it. I had his nature before I was born again. Then when I was born again, some of that still crept over in bad habit. But that bad habit was a sin that entangled me. It twisted me up in the knots. That was just one thing. You know, God had a lot of stuff he had to work out of me. He had to work on me. He's still working on me. Still working on me. Let us, uh, let us fix our eyes. Verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him. Listen to this. For the joy set before him he endured the cross. Do you know that he knew what was fixing to happen? That he was he knew Calvary was coming and he would be nailed to that cross. I mean tortured. He would endure pain that none of us has ever felt. I guarantee you that. Because you're still here. See, that pain was so bad it even killed him. That's how horrible the cross was. Praise God, he rose from the dead. But for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You know how he endured the cross? He had joy when he thought of you. <laughs> he had joy. And that's why the Word of God is encouraging to us to run. Run. Run the race. Flee. Flee from that stuff. See, he doesn't want us hurt. Let us fix our eyes on him. Let us not grow weary. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Nobody's been against you like they were against him. In the day in which we live in right now, there are more people against him than there ever were. He's not even walking the planet and they still hate him. They hated him then, they hate him now. Your old friends, the ones you need to throw off, they might hate you for it. They might. They might hate you for it. The old temptation that lurks around every corner for you, and you know which one that is, it will hate you for it if you run from it. See, everything in the flesh and all that's in the world and Satan himself and all his followers, they will, they're all against your recovery. None of them want you to have any success 
in life. They don't want you to have a better life. They just want you to have nothing. Kind of like the government at times just wants you to live at a certain standard and no more. They're glad to pay for it so long as they can keep you down. Satan's that way. He's a progressive. <laughs> he loves to just pass out a little, 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 just keep you stringing along, keep you, keep you, keep you coming, keep you coming, and give you nothing, no goals, no future, no life. The bravest thing you will ever do is throw off some things. One of the greatest things and most heroic things you'll ever do is run from some things. If you'll ever count your life as valuable as he counts your life, you'll do it. If ever you'll fix your eyes on him and you'll look at him the way he looks at you, you will run you will flee from those things that tangle you. You will gladly throw off everything that hinders you. Fall in love with Jesus. I noticed y'all call him by his name Yeshua. I like that. It's poetic. I like Jesus. I want to get back to me and Jesus. You know, just me and Jesus. The name which is above every name. The name it will be mocked until every name, every knee bows to it. To that name. Look to him tonight. Look to him. He wants to free you. He wants you to realize it and enjoy it. Look to the Lord this night. Father, thank you tonight for your love for us. and Thank you, Jesus, that you've given us a safe place to run. Help us, Lord, on times that we're tried, that we'll hide ourselves in you. Open up the wings of your salvation and engulf us in your safety. Let us hide ourselves in the wings of your healing. And Lord, I ask tonight that you would bind any force that comes against anyone in this room, both mentally, physically, and spiritually, that you would cast them forth. And God, that you would give everyone in this room the ability to throw things off and to run. Run to you. In Jesus' name, amen.